Good morning. Welcome to Grace Church. So happy to worship the risen Christ with you this Lord's Day. I say to you confidently that he is risen. He is risen indeed. A great reminder of the most important truth to which we must cling. Um, there are many important truths to which we must cling, but none more central to our faith than that one. If you haven't got a bulletin yet, please grab one. They're just outside on the table as you come in. And just for a few announcements before we uh, dive into our worship of the risen Christ. Uh, number one, uh, the CE hour is after this. We'll have a short break after the service and then dive into Joshua chapter 11, continuing our study through the book of Joshua. And very excited to dig through God, that portion of God's word with you. Uh, also, Wednesday night is prayer meeting, and we'll be here 6.30 to 7.30, and uh, look forward to our times before the throne of grace with each one of you. Uh, also, next Sunday, I, I may have mistitled this, so don't, get, don't, uh, don't let your red flags go up too high here, but it says special business meeting. It's more like a precursor to our business meeting. So at the end of the month, we have our quarterly business meeting where we vote on our budget. Uh, for the 2023 year and so we like to have a meeting before that so everyone can look it over ask questions talk about debate etc whatever is needed uh, so that uh, we're not coming into the the vote uh, uninformed and uh, whatnot so that's a great we, we won't be making any decisions on the budget next Sunday but it's a time for us to go over it line by line and look at it and uh, let you ask the questions that you have so please, please, if you're a member of this church, make time to be here. We'll do that in the CE hour next Lord's Day, Lord willing. Okay? So again, not voting on anything next week, but just reviewing the budget, getting familiar with it, asking questions of it. If we want to say, hey, I, it's a chance to debate. If we don't think that uh, we, should, we should increase or decrease funds in a particular area, we can have that because then the vote will be on the 30th at the end of the month. So just want you to be informed, and we'll have a good discussion about that. So, that is then. All right, I think that does it for announcements. So, for our call to worship today, would you take your Bibles or just listen to me as we turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to read just the last five verses of the chapter. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We see here a snapshot of what we were made for and a snapshot of what we are to do and a full detailing of the resources given to us and that is so what are we supposed to what is our purpose well, as they did in verse 17 to worship to worship the risen Christ what's our commission what's our task to go and make disciples and what is our limitless amount of resources it's the risen Christ himself which is the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Go, therefore, and make disciples. And he concludes, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Whatever God has called you to do in the specific details and in this, our commission of making disciples, he has promised to be with you. And as we have often cited C.S. Lewis in this, the man who has God and everything else, 
has no more than the man who has God alone. You have everything you need if you have the risen Christ. So let us worship our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit together. Um, banking on, counting on, entrusting our soul to this promise. I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray and then we'll begin in our singing. Let's pray. Father, you are the great God, the sovereign of the universe. You are the one who rules all things by the word of your power. There is none like you. Father, we want to worship you as you deserve, um, infallible as we are. Father, we want you to be pleased with our worship. Father, thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you have given us everything you need. Thank you for inviting us in this task of making disciples. You don't need us, but you delight to use us, and we praise you for that. Father, help us to spend our lives in telling others about the greatness of who you are and the mighty works that you have done. It'll be worth it. So let us do it, Father. Help us to that end. Father, bless our worship now. Might you be pleased with it. May we seek to please you first and foremost and you alone. So, Father, we need your help to do that. We bring our, our hearts full of praise and worship to you and ask that it would be an offering pleasing in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our first song today, take your inserts out of your bulletin, and we will sing His Be the Victor's Name, all five verses. If you're able stand and willing, stand with me and sing His Be the Victor's Name, all five verses together on your insert there. His be the victor's name who fought the fight alone. Try. Amen. For our responsive reading, take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 40. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll read out of the ESV together. If you don't have an ESV Bible, there's one in the pew rack in front of you. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. We read the first 11 verses last week. We'll continue in the chapter, verses 12 to 24. That's on page 600, if you're using the Pew Bible, uh, page 600, Isaiah 40, we'll read verses 12 through 4, I'll start with the even verses, congregation will read the odd verses, and then we'll all read verse 24 together. Isaiah 40, verses 12 and following, let's read together. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span? enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding?
Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. He brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as empty. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, and he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like a stubble. A clear contrast between the majesty of our God and the insignificance of mankind by comparison. Mankind has tremendous value and infinite worth because God made him in his image. But apart from God, we can do nothing and we are nothing. Let's keep worshiping our great God and sing the next hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. It's on number 26 in your hymnals. Number 26, I sing the mighty power of God. Remain standing if you're able, and we'll sing all three verses together. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And we'll wait at this time for our ushers as we take our morning offering and continue worshiping our great God through our giving. Let's pray together as a church. Father, all that we have is yours. All that there is in the universe is yours. You are the maker, we the creature, and we cannot give to you anything but which is already your own. So we do not give to increase you, to benefit you in any way. We do not give to buy your favor, for we never could. Our wickedness has separated us from you. We do not give in any way, shape, or form to put you in our debts. 
that too is impossible. So let us not give for these fraudulent means, but let us give now to please you, to show our love for you, to show our dependence on you more than the wealth to which you've entrusted us. And Father, we ask your blessing upon these funds. Give us wisdom to use them wisely, and might they serve to spread the gospel in Otsego and our surrounding areas. Father, thank you for this church and for your hand sustaining it. We pray for the church worldwide as they worship you today on this Lord's Day, to celebrate the resurrection and to worship you, the Almighty God. We pray for the ones we know specifically. We think of our missionaries in Chile. And we pray for the Flinks, that you would bless their Lord's Day services. And the church in Antofagasta would be strengthened, built up, and that it would uh, flourish under Pastor Andres' leadership. We pray for a new work to begin soon. And as that, those preparations are underway, we ask, as Paul prayed, that the word of the Lord would speed ahead and be honored uh, wherever you would uh, send them next there. We pray for Calvary Baptist Church in Wakefield. We ask that you'd bless their services today while Pastor Riley is away. Might the church still gather and worship you well and that uh, the, this church will be strengthened, sinners convicted, in the name of Jesus Christ, glorified there in Wakefield as well. Father, what a privilege it is to be called your children and to worship you in spirit and truth. Help us to that end for your glory and our joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jody. Now for our Old Testament and New Testament scripture readings, take your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 11 through 25. Exodus chapter 2, we'll read verses 11 through 25 today for our Old Testament reading. We've completed Genesis, we're now into the story of God's people in slavery in Egypt. And one thing 
to remember as we come to Exodus, right? I've, I've said this before, Exodus starts the idea, and practically speaking, of the kingdom of God. And this theme is going to dominate the rest of the Old Testament. It is all about the kingdom. And you remember, in just these first, here we go, take your one, Genesis 1 through 11, or watch me do mine, right? Here, hold it up. There's more time here than in the rest of the Bible put together, discounting future prophecies, okay? And Genesis, if you take all of Genesis, that only grows to here, okay? And let me find, Ma let me get to Malachi real quick. There's Matthew, Malachi. Here we go. Here's the end of the Old Testament. Here's the Old Testament. More time here than here. I got to lift it up. Thank you, honey. So, here's before Exodus. Here's the rest of the Old Testament. This is about the kingdom. It's as if God is racing through millennia to get us to this concept of the kingdom. Okay? To not say that any of this is unimportant. This is foundational. This is absolutely important. But we have now hit what God's going to spend the bulk of the ink on in the Old Testament. We get here to this idea of the kingdom. And we're seeing the preparation for it here in the book of Exodus. Remember that as you're reading. So, chapter 2, verse 11. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the matter the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flocks. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Reuel, he said to them, How is it you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Footnote, Gershom sounds like the Hebrew word for sojourner. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry of rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. We have here interesting language used about our God. It is, the, 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 the big word for it is anthropomorphic, giving non-human-like characteristics to a, sorry, I got that backwards, giving human-like characteristics to a non-human entity, all right? This is often used in poetic language. This is often used in our own descriptions to this day. But it says, God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Did God forget? Was God sitting on his proverbial throne, looking down on the earth, and then, wait a minute, they're, in, they're enslaved in Egypt. Of course not. That's blasphemous ideas to consider that God forgot. But God uses this word, remembered. He used it with Noah on the ark. After 150 days of floating on the waters of the earth, God remembered Noah and sent the east wind and dried it. He did not forget. God, the omniscient one, can't forget. He knows all. But we use human language to describe non-human things because our, we have, our language is inadequate. 
our knowledge is inadequate. But God has not forgot. He's remembered. He made this promise. Genesis 15, remember? Your descendants will go down into the land of Egypt for 400 years. This was promised ahead of time. Our God does not forget. But when God then sets himself to act on behalf of his people, we use the language of now God remembered and now he is going to act. You must be able to, to use anthropomorphic language about God without taking it strictly literally, or you will get yourself into heresy really quickly. But our God knows, our God is in control, and he, he uses uh, his people, and he uses these circumstances of human events to bring about his good and glorious will. So let us take heart in that. Turn with me to Mark chapter 7 for our New Testament reading. Mark chapter 7. And we're going to read verses 14 through 30. 14 through 30. Uh, that is on page 843 if you're using the Pew Bible. Mark 7, 14 through 30. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So much for the goodness of man. Verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, but even yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Some people often cringe at this statement of Jesus where he looks at this woman asking for help for a miracle and basically says, go home, dog. It's not your turn. It can be taken in that way. Um, I don't think that gets at the heart of what Jesus was saying, however. Okay? Um, the, the, he is doing two things simultaneously. One fulfilling his purpose to come to his own people and his own people who would not receive him. Right? Jesus came to the Jewish people as the Jewish Messiah to fulfill Jewish prophecies that God made to the Jews. That was his task. And now he's also speaking within the context of the day. And the Jews referred to Gentiles as dogs. They were unclean. They did not follow the Levitical commands for cleanliness, etc. And so he's speaking into it, but into their, their vernacular of the day. But even as you think about it, in the Old Testament, were there any Gentiles who were drawn to faith in Yahweh God? Of course. Of course. And that was the purpose, was for the Jewish nation to be a light of the glory of Yahweh to draw that God would use, excuse me, to draw outsiders to him. 
And we saw that happen, most notably uh, in the person of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. I heard the glory of your God and had to come and see it myself. Okay? And yet, this woman, like uh, Naaman the Gentile, like Ruth the Gentile, like uh, Uriah the Gentile, and like Rahab the Gentile, came to God by faith, the only way a sinner comes to God, and was received. Uh, her, her statement is one of, of absolute faith in the person of Jesus Christ, and he responds with blessing and answering her request. All right, more we could talk about that, but I'm not preaching Mark today, so we'll continue on. Uh, take your hymn books at this time, stand with me, and turn to hymn number 266, a former hymn of the month here. Come, let us join our cheerful song. Let's sing uh, number 266. Come, let us join our cheerful songs, and we'll sing all four verses together. Let's sing.
Ready if you would. Uh, both to save my voice and also to give us a little focus on the words there. Look at verse 6 and think of that day when this happens. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways. From pole to pole that wars may cease. And I copied the wrong word there, not absorbed. That, and all be prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and round his pierced feet fair flowers of paradise extend their fragrance ever sweet. When do you stop and smell the flowers? When you're storming the beaches of Normandy on D-Day? No. When you have absolute peace and you have nothing to fear. And that, brothers and sisters, is what the kingdom of Christ is will be. Let's sing the seventh and final verse together. Crown him the Lord of years. Thank you for standing so long. Please remain standing. I usually let you sit before that, and I just forgot. I was enjoying it so much. Uh, our scripture reading now before the sermon is Psalm 113. Psalm 113, if you'd remain standing for the scripture reading and the prayer. I would appreciate that. Psalm 113. Um, I encourage you to follow along. If you're in the Pew Bibles, uh, Psalm 113 will be on page 510. Psalm 113, page 510. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. I'll lead us in a prayer now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for allowing us here to, to gather today uh, freely to uh, read and study your word. Lord, we pray that you would guide and direct Pastor Dave um, as he strives to teach us from your word, Lord, that uh, you would uh, help him to speak boldly and clearly. Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word, that we would uh, have ears to hear. Um, that uh, as, we, as we read your word here, that we would find encouragement and reasons to praise, um, to praise you and bless you. Uh, while you deserve much more than we can give, that we would recognize you um, sitting rightly on your throne, high above all. Um, just thank you, Lord. We, we pray for that our service here today would uh, honor and glorify you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> what does our society do, what does our culture do with greatness? When we see greatness, what do we do? We praise it, right? Even if it's only for 15 minutes, we praise it. We call it, what, the 15 minutes of fame? Someone pops in for doing something good, astounding, embarrassing, and YouTube makes us remember it for about 15 minutes. And 
We bring it. We, we praise it. We celebrate it. Do you guys remember, does this name ring a bell, Joe the Plumber? Anybody? The election, presidential election of 2008. Some guy in the crowd walked up to then candidate Senator Obama and said, hi, my name's Joe, I'm a plumber, and what are your policies going to do for me, and how is this going to help, or, or something to that effect. I didn't go back and watch the clip. I, and the next day, everything was Joe the plumber, Joe the plumber. And the very next debate, Senator Obama uh, said, well, Joe the plumber, he's talking to Joe the plumber. And then Senator McCain picked it up, and he was talking to Joe the plumber. I just remember uh, the news article I read the next day, who was the winner of the second debate? Joe the plumber. All right. <laughs> Here he was. Uh, I, he was referenced a couple more times in the campaign, and literally I have not thought about him since until he randomly popped into my head about a month ago. And I thought, oh, yeah, that guy. All right. I couldn't even tell you his real name. He gave a pseudonym, Joe. Uh, and I remember reading up on him, and this guy was a celebrity here in the United States for the month of October 2008. But he's here, and he's gone. We do the same for many others that we think are great. I told you about my best friend Derek and I going to Chicago and seeing the, the bronze statue of Michael Jordan outside the United Center. Uh, both of us, misplaced Bulls fans in Ohio, grew up cheering for Michael Jordan, and we went and saw this statue. And it, the best there ever was, the best there ever will be. But uh, nobody's praising Michael Jordan's basketball skills right now. Very few people would, would fear taking him on in a game. So we praise greatness in our society. But what should we do? Well, I'm going to suggest that we're not far off in praising greatness, but we ought to praise it appropriately. Virtue ought to be praised. Um, courage, honor, love, sacrifice, things that are good ought to be praised, but they ought to be done so appropriately. Appropriate to the one who has done the, the doer of the deeds. We should not overdo it, but we tend to, right? I mean, Joe the plumber was all over the news and uh, for about a month. And the, the, the attention he got was disproportionate uh, to his plumbing skills. Um, but, uh, and I would say that the, the adulation we give people is disproportionate to what they deserve. We tend to overhype things, whether they're good or bad. Um, you can just waste a lot of time going on the internet and saying the best and then fill in the blank horse you've ever seen the best hitters in baseball the best generals in military history and you can get long lists uh, books resources videos etc we tend to overhype uh, people and their greatness so how does this relate to psalm 113 well, we are in one of my favorite seasons of life, in between books in the Bible, where I get to go through the Psalms and, and preach through them, and I, and I love doing that. And so we come to Psalm 113 today. These are not chapters in a book, per se, like we 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians is divided in chapters. These are songs. These are poems written uh, to our God, and this is, this is the hymn book of the Hebrews, as Pastor Murray was frequent to say, and it has been preserved for us uh, to consider how we ought to worship our great God. So though we as humans tend to overdo greatness, I'm going to ask you to try to overdo something here today based on Psalm 113. I'm going to ask you to overdo it when it comes to praising the triune God. And I use that word a little bit tongue-in-cheek because we cannot possibly overdo. We can't give God too much praise. We cannot overhype the triune God of Scripture. 
we must praise him and do our best despite our limitations. And that is my proposition to you today. You must praise the triune God according to his excellent greatness. You must praise him according to his excellent greatness. Or another way of saying that is how he deserves to be praised. Uh, the words excellent greatness are not taken from this psalm. They're actually taken from Psalm 150 is where the same phrase is used. But that, that too is a call to praise of God to the whole earth. It concludes, let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. The same here, the same call is going to be made here in Psalm 113. So you must praise the triune God according to his excellent greatness. And I think the text answers the question how, how to do it. And I see four ways that we're to do it from this text. And we'll look at these in turn. Number one, we are to praise the triune God in time. Number two, we're to praise him in territory. Number three, we are to praise him in transcendence. And number four, we are to praise him in triumph. And so we'll look at those here in our text this day. But the first way that you must praise the triune God is according to his excellent greatness is in time. Now, maybe I should just back up before diving in there. The first verse gives the command three times. Praise Yahweh. Praise, O servants of Yahweh. Praise the name of Yahweh. And when you see, I've said this before, when you see the word Lord in all caps, that lets you know the Hebrew uh, word Yahweh is behind that. That's what word is being used there if you see a capital l with lowercase letters that's a different word so what this word is pointing us to is the covenant name of god to the people of israel the personal name by which he revealed himself to his people he is the covenant keeping god as we're going to see as we go through the book of exodus he is the god who brought them out of the land of egypt the god who freed them and made them a people and made them a nation, fulfilling his centuries-old promise to Abraham. And so this is a special name of God, and that is to whom it is addressed. We are commanded three times, praise Yahweh, worship Yahweh, adore Yahweh. So the first way to do it is in time. Look at verse 2. Blessed be the name of Yahweh from this time forth and forevermore. The praise of Yahweh is to begin as soon as you are able and to continue forever. Now, how many of you are able to do anything forever? see no hands that's a good thing you cannot hold your breath forever you cannot eat forever you cannot sleep forever okay we are limited we are time bound we are finite and so i think that the, the psalmist whomever it is we don't know acknowledges that praise yahweh from this time forth right now begin as soon as you are able, when you wake up in the day, praise Yahweh. When you understand the call, the command to obey him, praise Yahweh. But even though we are finite, we are time bound, we are limited, God is not. Therefore, he deserves to be praised infinitely. According to his excellent greatness, according to who he is. Think of the people we have praised, rightly or wrongly. George Washington, the father of our country. He has been rightly called. But you know what? Nearly 6,000 years of human history went by just fine without George Washington. The world didn't cease to exist because George Washington wasn't here. And George Washington lived his life, 63 years, I believe, and... Uh, he is gone. Alexander the Great 
only lived about half of that. And he conquered the known world, but even then it wasn't the whole world. And shortly after, his empire divided, and then a couple of centuries later, his empire crumbled. But God is not like that. God is not like man. He is not bound by time. How does the triune God relate to time? Well, first of all, he is outside of it. He is not bound by time. He, God, is eternal. If you can't figure that out, it means you're alive and you have a pulse and your brain is working. Good job. But time, brothers and sisters, is God's servant. First of all, we see that in Genesis 1 because God created it. Genesis 1, verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day and the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now that's on day four, and we know there were three days before that, and they were marked by time because God made time. God created time. There was a time when there was no time. And in that timelessness, God is. Because he is not bound by time. There will be a time yet future when there is no time. And God will be. And God is then too. God created time. Also, God controls time. Time is his servant. Can you think of what time we just studied here recently about God controlling time? Say in Joshua chapter 9, where Joshua and the army needed more time in the day, like we all feel like we do nearly every day, to get the task done. And God stood the sun still and stopped time, as it were. It says for about a whole day. One of the dearest people I love, whenever I would ask her, what do you want for Christmas, Mom? She would always say, a 48-hour day. Didn't realize her wisdom until I became an apparent, a parent, but uh, I never got her one, and no one's gotten me one of those yet. But Joshua and the children of Israel got a 48-hour day because God controls time. Or think of King Hezekiah. When he asked for a sign, the prophet said, what do you want? you want the shadow to increase or do you want the shadow to decrease? He said, I want time to go back 15 paces. And God did it. Time is God's servant, not the other way around. But also time is God's tool. You see that? Um, here, think about the, how God has used time in human history to accomplish his ends. Abraham had to wait until he was 100 years old for the promised son. Even though the God promised him the son, the family, the nation, when he was 75. God had him wait 25 additional years. And then think about the most excruciating day of Abraham's life when God called him to offer up that son. And it was only when he laid him on the altar, bound, and had the knife poised to strike, when God revealed the ram stuck in the thickets. Time is God's tool to bring about his ends. Or think of Abraham when he was seeking a wife, for Isaac and he sent his servant back to his homeland and the servant prayed and said God bless my journey please bring me the right bride for my master's son and it says before he had finished speaking behold Rebecca came out with her water jar on her shoulder why did she come then and not two hours later why did she come then and not two hours earlier and he missed the whole thing because God is in control of time, and time is his tool. Which is why Yahweh ought to be praised from this time forth and forevermore. 
He is praised in time. Or think, we just finished reading Genesis. Joseph. Joseph is taken down to Egypt against his will. He wants to leave and go home to his family. Maybe not his brothers, but his dad for sure. And when did he have the when did Joseph have the best time to leave Egypt? His last two years in prison. Right? He helps the butler. And his request is, hey, when you get out, will you just tell Pharaoh, I'm in here for something I didn't do, and let me out, and let me go home. That's all I'm asking. And yet the butler forgot him. And he spends two more years there. You say, well, that's the butler's fault. What did God have to do with that? (laughs) Not according to Joseph. God sent him to Egypt so that he could be raised to vice Pharaoh, so that he could save many lives. The forgetting of Joseph in jail by the butler for two more years was God's work in time. Or maybe the best expression of this is in Galatians 4.4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son at just the right time. Now, that's probably, we could do a whole Christmas sermon on that verse, so I won't do that now. But at just the right time, 4,000 plus years into human history, from Genesis 3 on, where death and sin is causing its destruction, and a a Savior had been promised, Genesis 3.15, and God waits 4,000 years before sending His Son at just the right time because time is God's tool. Therefore, let's praise him from this point and forevermore. Before we go from this idea of time, let's stop and think just real quickly about the other gods, the competitor gods. How do they relate to time? The triune God is outside of time. He created time. He's in control of time. It's his tool. What about the other gods? Time is greater than them. Let's look at a few that maybe you might be tempted to worship. All right? And there's significantly more than this. But think about the Minnesota Vikings. They bow to the clock. They play 15-minute quarters, not 13, not 14, not two hours. They have a 25-second play clock to get the snap off. They only play one day a week. Not four. They only play five months out of the year. They are bound by time. If the Minnesota Vikings or pick your team is your God, he is a very controlled, bound God by time. No basketball player says that the 517 three-pointers that he shot in the offseason should count towards his career point total, right? Because it's, it's not in the right time. It doesn't count that God is bound by time. Or think about the American dollar, if that is your God. First of all, it didn't exist for about 6,000 years. So you have a very recent God. Doesn't have a great track record. And think about that God just recently, say, in 2008, when he suddenly became nearly worthless. Or if you can think a little longer, none of you were there, but maybe you have heard, say 1932, called the Great Depression. The American dollar is a flimsy God. Or think about this God, your family. First of all, you only get to enjoy him for about 70 years, maybe 80 by reason of strength. And even then, you don't get to enjoy them all at the same time. You don't get to enjoy your grandparents, your parents, and your children, and your grandchildren all together at the same time. If your family is your God, they are very much bound by time. You have them for a little while, and then they are gone. All the gods that you and I can manufacture and worship are bound by time they are servants of time the god 
of Scripture, the triune God, is over, over time. He's Lord of time and thus should be praised from this time forth and forevermore. So let me ask you, which God should you praise? The gods who are slaves to time or the God of Scripture who invented and controls time? Thus, the first way you must praise the triune God according to his excellent greatness is in time, from this time forth and forevermore. The second way is in territory. Look at verse 3. What territory? From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of Yahweh is to be praised. It's a poetic way, a Middle Eastern way, an Eastern way of saying all over the globe, everywhere, Yahweh is to be praised. Wherever God has you, he is to be praised. Because, as we read in our, in our um, call to worship this morning, God is with us wherever we go. Wherever you go, God is with you. The great transcendent triune God is with you wherever you go. There's not a place in heaven, earth, or hell that you could go where God is not there. And where he is, he is there in all of his infinite goodness and person. And so you must worship him wherever you are. And now while we set rightfully set aside this day to worship God together, and we come to this place to worship him, and this is good and right, there's not one place in your life that should be devoid of worship. When you wake up in the morning, in the privacy of your bedroom or your bathroom or your garage, Jesus Christ is worthy of worship. When you gather with your family, he is to be praised. When you work, go to work, he is worthy of praise there as well. This does not mean that we spend all of our day in song. Doesn't mean we spend all of our day just reading and reciting scripture, but all of life is to be lived for his glory, for his praise, to put his greatness on display. We're told there in verse 1, praise the name of Yahweh. That the word name in Hebrew is used to, to reference the totality of the person, to give praise to all that God is. And that's to happen from the rising of the sun to its setting. The name, the character, the person of Yahweh is to be praised. So yes, in all of your territory, wherever you inhabit, but not just that, in all of territory. Wherever God is, there he must be worshipped. And where is God, brothers and sisters? Everywhere. He is to be praised. The right response to God, no matter where you are, if you were Neil Armstrong and you made it to the moon, or if you were down in the depths of the Pacific Ocean in a submarine, or if you're on vacation in Florida, or if you're at work in Minnesota, or if you get a chance to go to Israel, the name of Yahweh is to be praised. Now think about it. This was not the case of the gods whom other people worship. They are not just time-bound, they are space-bound. And my favorite, one of my favorite passages, I've cited it frequently, 1 Kings 20, where Ahab, the worst king of Israel, God uses to defeat the, his enemy, the Syrians. And what do the Syrians say? Well, they won because their God is the God of the hills. And our gods are the God of the plains. Their God is bound to the hills. If we get him out into the plains, we'll defeat him. And so prophet comes to Ahab, the wickedest king of Israel in their whole history, and says, the Syrians are coming. They're replacing their army man for man, about 127,000, give or take, that you defeated last time because I was with you. You're going to defeat them again, not because there's any goodness in you, Ahab, but because they say, I'm only the God of the hills. I will show them I am the God of the plains. I am the God of everywhere. Dagon was limited to the sea. 
uh, Chemosh to Moab, Baal to Canaan. They all had their spheres. No one, I assure you, bows and worships the Minnesota Vikings in Saudi Arabia. Nor should they. The gods that we make are limited. Our God is not limited to any territory. The whole world is his. As he says in Isaiah, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. He is worthy to be praised everywhere. So which God should you praise? The gods of limited space? Or the omnipresent triune God of Scripture. The first way that you must praise this triune God is according to his excellent greatness is in time. The second way is in territory. And the third way is in transcendence. Look at verse 4 and following. Yahweh is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like Yahweh our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? So if this triune God is to be worshipped in transcendence, that which is above all, that which is without limits, how do limited people, limited creatures like us, worship a transcendent, infinite God? The answer is imperfectly but not incorrectly or flippantly or faddishly, but as he commands. God knows our weaknesses. He remembers our frame, the psalmist says. He remembers we're but dust. But still we are to worship him as he commands. We'll get there, I think, next week in our reading. What did he say to Moses? Take off your shoes you are standing on holy ground we are to worship him in reverence the author of hebrews states in hebrews chapter 12 verses 28 and 29 therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to god acceptable worship what is acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Note, he is not a cuddly teddy bear or an avuncular uncle. Our God is a consuming fire. Worship him in reverence. Worship him with humble obedience, like Abraham offering up Isaac. No matter what God asks of you, You must worship him with it. Also worship him in the ways and means prescribed. Don't worship him on your terms in the way you think he should be worshipped. How did that work for Cain? God called for an offering of blood and Cain said, well, I'm a man of the ground. I'm going to bring fruit and produce. And it's not wrong to be a man of the ground and grow produce. But as God prescribed later, take your produce to your brother, trade him some produce for a lamb. We worship God as he commands by the means prescribed. Why do we preach the word? Why do we read scripture? Why do we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Because Christ commanded us to do these things in worship. Why do we not do a bunch of other things? Because Christ did not command them. We are bound to worship him as he commands, not as we desire. So don't worship God according to your appetites, like Esau, right? Traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. I'm hungry. It makes me feel good. That's why I worship this way. Your feelings are based on physical desires, animal instincts, the state of your digestion, and personal whims. So don't base your worship of the triune God on your feelings. Base them on truth. Don't base them according to your wishes, what you want. Do your wishes, do your desires ever carry you astray? Think Ahab and Naboth's vineyard? 
I want that vineyard. Well, I'm commanded not to sell it to you. Okay, I'll kill you or have my wife do it for me. Worship is not about what you like or what you want. We don't worship God that way. We worship as he desires. And please know that we don't pick the songs that we sing here because we like them. Or let me be very precise. I don't pick the songs that we sing here because I like them. If someone asks you, what songs do you sing? You try to sing songs that worship, help us worship our God with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And do not worship a God, do, do not worship God, excuse me, according to your priorities. Remember King Saul? Needing to go into battle, and Samuel doesn't show up in time for the sacrifice, and the people are starting to get scared. We haven't offered the sacrifice. Let's get out of here. His army is dwindling before his eyes. So he says, all right, fine, I'll do it. I need an army. I need it right now. So I'm going to offer the sacrifice. Problem is, Saul's not authorized to do it. His priorities were not the first ones to be considered. You cannot worship God how you want in order to get what you want. That's manipulation, and we cannot manipulate our God. Psalm 115, verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Romans eleven thirty six. for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So which God should you praise? The gods of your fleeting whims, fattish trims, fattish trims, fattish trends, and physical appetites, or the transcendent triune God of Scripture? I think the choice is clear. The first way that you must praise the triune God according to his excellent greatness is in time. The second way is in territory. The third way is in transcendence. And the fourth way in our psalm today, is in triumph. Look at our last three verses, seven through nine. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with princes, with the princes of his people. Right? God cares for the poor and needy. These are the people who appear most insignificant in society. The poor and needy have no voice. Does our triune God ever lift the poor out of their suffering to bless them? Yes, he does. When we think of examples, Job, the richest man in the East, soon became a man with absolute nothing, sitting in a pile of ashes, scraping sores off his body. Or think of Ruth and Naomi coming back penniless to Bethlehem with nothing, and the only thing they can do is go and glean in the fields of whatever the, the wealthy planters drop behind. Or think of Mephibosheth. Kids, remember how to pronounce that one, okay? Mephibosheth, the grandson of Saul, would have possibly been in line for the throne, but he is a pauper, he is a cripple. And King David lifts the grandson of his mortal enemy and lets him eat at his table all the days of his life. So if you are poor and needy, look to God for your daily needs. Now, I realize that's hard to do for all of us who live in Disneyland. Or America, as we like to call it. So you have to work against our culture's infatuation and attainment of riches. How can you do that? Number one, pray as you were taught to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not magic words, but it are, they are right words. Remind your children, parents. Remind yourself, adults, that your bread this day depends on the provision of God and not the fullness of your freezers. Ask God for daily graces. 
Ask him each day for what you need. Ask him for protection. Ask him for cars that run. Ask them for, for, for a provision of a job. And when he answers them, what should you do? Praise him. Thank him. Remind yourself that you are dependent on him. He lifts the poor and needy from the ash heap. But not only the poor and needy, he lifts the barren woman. Verse 9, he gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. The barren woman in Jewish society was missing the one thing she needed most in order to thrive in life. To be viewed as successful, to be taken care of and provided for, the barren woman needed children. Does God care for the barren woman? Absolutely. Sarah, we've already mentioned, barren for many decades before being given Isaac. Rebecca was barren for 20 years. Isaac prayed for God to open her womb. Or Hannah, the mother of Samuel, was barren for many years. Remember the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4 who constantly cared for Elisha? And his needs had an aged husband and no children. God gave her a son to provide and care for her. So let me ask you, where is your faith barren? Where is it fruitless? Where are you not seeing the growth, the life that needs to be there? Start there. Focus there. Pray there. Labor there in your soul for God's fruitfulness to abound. But you know who else who appears to be barren right now than just physical, childless women? Do you know who else doesn't have the one thing they want and need to survive and thrive? The Christian who is longing for Christ's kingdom. It's not here yet. The expectant saint is longing for Christ's kingdom. We're taught to pray that it would come. So prioritize your life towards Christ's kingdom. And you know what? You may not see it in your lifetime. You may close your eyes in death and all of your detractors will say, well, here was yet another man or woman who was hoping for Jesus to come back. And well, where's the promise of his coming? Just like our fathers, everything goes on as it did. It matters not what the scoffers say, brothers and sisters. It matters only what the sovereign of the universe, the omnipotent and soon coming king, Jesus Christ, says. And he has said he is coming. And he is coming quickly on his timetable, not yours. So which God should you praise? The omnipotent gods who have not conquered your fears, your weaknesses, and your failures? Or the triumphant God of Scripture who has conquered both your sin and death by his death on the cross? Thus I conclude the first way that you must praise the triune God according to his excellent greatness is in time, from this time forth and forevermore. The second way is in territory, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, no matter where you are. He is worthy to be praised. In transcendence, he is high above all other gods above the earth. And in triumph, looking for, longing for the appearing of our great God when he returns as the conquering king. So how do you do that? Well, read your Bible. Read it to cure you of your flippancy. Read it to cure you of the appearance and the appeal of fads. Read it to cure you of your impress, being impressed with this world. Second, worship with God's people to please God, not yourself. Number three, disciple 
God's people in order to rely on God's power, not your skill. Number four, share the gospel with lost people so that you may grow in your humility. If you're impressed with yourself, then I want you to first go and tell me how many people you have physically raised from the dead. And when you get somewhere north of a big fat zero, you might start to be impressed with yourself. But what God has called us to do is even more difficult than that. is to raise the spiritual dead from spiritual condemnation to spiritual life. But if you share the gospel, as scriptures tell you, then you can have all the confidence in the world in God who said, let light shine out of darkness to shine into the dead hearts and give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's do this together, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Father, you are worthy to be praised and we ought to do that. So help us to continue praising you wherever you have us, wherever we are, while we draw breath, might we spread a passion to see you praised by all peoples until you call us home. Help us to long for that day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For our closing hymn today, let's sing this song of of self-inquiry, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? Number 421. Am I a Soldier of a Cross, the Follower of the Lamb? We'll sing the four verses in the hymnal. If you take your insert out, there's two more verses there that point us to the end. We'll sing all six verses together. Number 421, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? If you're able and willing, stand with me. And we'll sing together. Am I a Soldier of the Cross? Brothers and sisters, consider this, as I've already cited, Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Go in peace, brothers and sisters, praising the triune God with reverence and awe as he deserves and demands. You exist for this purpose. It is the most important and delightful thing that you can do for your soul and for those you love. You are dismissed. Children.